Welcome everybody. Thank you for so thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for those uh, connected online. My name is Sara Penicino. I'm uh, the professor of international human rights uh, here at Johns Hopkins Science Europe. Uh, and I'm also the host of the human trafficking uh, seminar series, which is hosted in the context of the Beeper seminar series. Tonight, our first uh, seminar, we have a special guest, someone who has been with us last year uh, and has took, taken part to the course in last year's edition. And to this year, she's back to share with us more information and a more thorough analysis of our amazing work and the role of civil society organizations in providing access to justice and assistance to victims of labor exploitation, specifically in Serbia and in the Balkan uh, region. So I welcome Maria Andjelkovic, thank you very much. Maria is the president and one of the founders of the uh, Astra NGO, an NGO that focuses on anti-trafficking in uh, Serbia specifically. Here with me at the table, I'm joined by Alexandra Malangone, whom you, uh, most of you know, because she's an adjunct fellow here at uh, Johns Hopkins Science uh, Europe. She is specifically involved in a project on human trafficking and a project that will develop hopefully in the uh, coming years, but that for the time being uh, sees her being our practitioner in house, someone who brings her expertise to the table and that allows us to bring together different perspective on the topic on human trafficking from the field and combine them with the academic look on this topic. Um, I will not waste uh, more time in uh, in introducing both the speakers because you will realize that they will both show uh, what they are about when they uh, when they will start talking. Especially Maria, I wanna uh, thank you for taking the time for joining us and to telling us more about the amazing work that uh, your organization does in the Balkan. I also wanna thank Alexandra for helping us for facilitating this conversation with Maria and helping us to bring. Uh, knowledge and more information to the general audience and especially to our students uh, about uh, actions against uh, human trafficking. Now, uh, the presentation is going to last around 40, 45 minutes, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. There can be questions coming from our audience online as well, and I will be, um, let's say, handling the Q&A. So please, Raise your hand if you want to ask a question from the audience in presence. And if you are listening from remote online, please feel free to um, ask your questions in the Q&A box on the Zoom uh, platform. Maria, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sara. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm really honored to present before the students of this remarkable university. And um, uh, uh, in the next 30 minutes, I will try to explain briefly everything that we are doing uh, in combating trafficking in human beings, particularly focusing on the labor exploitation that is becoming more and more, let's say, popular recently. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I'm coming from uh, uh, the NGO Astra, uh, Anti-Trafficking Action that was founded in 2000. And uh, when we started, uh, apart from choosing the topic of trafficking, we also, like many other NGOs, decided uh, what we are going to do. So we decided that we are going to deal only with prevention and education, and that's it. So we started the SOS Info Hotline. It's uh, uh, We were imagining that we will inform people from Serbia who wants to travel abroad. In that time, that was usually Italy, Spain, uh, Germany, what kind of documents they should prepare, how to apply for a visa, how to get a, res a working permit, and so on. Uh, so that is how we started. We did a lot of media campaigns, a lot of training, seminars, workshops. But then in March 2003, we received a call from a victim of trafficking, and then we realized that we don't know where to, where to refer the victim, because in that time, uh, we didn't still have a um, had a national referral mechanism in Serbia. So we decided also to start uh, working on our second program, which is now the, the biggest uh, program in Astra, Victim Assistance uh, Program and SOS Hotline. Uh, 
uh, and also we start to monitor uh, what's going on with the state institutions, how they are treating victims, how their victims' rights are implemented. So our program of monitoring and reporting uh, also developed. And then we saw that some things are not working and we decided also to work on policy and to influence policy level, to change the laws, to change the bylaws, uh, to, to define the procedures and so on. To, to be involved in the building of the national refer mechanism. Uh, and uh, last but not least, very soon we realized that here we are talking about uh, organized crime and that we cannot fight it ourselves. So we start to do networking first with the NGOs in Serbia and then Europe and then worldwide, but also later with international organizations and state institutions who were um, who could uh, assist and provide assistance to victims of trafficking? So that is how we came to this holistic approach. Too 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 much work for us, but uh, uh, we are glad that we have this approach because uh, in in the uh, holistic, if you observe the trafficking in a holistic way, that is the only way you could uh, see it from uh, different angles. And uh, I must say that uh, uh, our core work is victim assistance and working in the field, because from there we receive the information, what's going on in the field, what are the trends, what are the needs of the victims? And based on that, we built our uh, other actions and we can plan, plan our other activities. Um, so uh, speaking of network, maybe I should only mention that also network of professionals are also uh, important. In this moment, we created a network of 20 therapists, for example, and 25 lawyers who are supporting victims in overcoming the trauma or uh, legal assistance, uh, providing legal assistance to the victims. Also network of academia, because we are here today, is also important and I think um, your your university is one of the unique who has this program, so it's really important to to cherish it. Uh, I think I pressed the wrong button. Okay. Um, uh, when I mentioned that the victim assistance program is the core program, just to briefly tell tell you uh, tell you uh, how it looks like in numbers. That means that in 20 years, we through our SOS hotline received almost 52,000 calls from uh, uh, different people and we identify and supported 562 victims of trafficking, uh, mostly women and girls for sexual exploitation, but uh, in the total number of victims, 32% uh, uh, in average are children. Uh, but recently we have more and more cases of uh, labor exploitation of men, but also forced begging, forced criminality and so on. Uh, regarding the trends, they are different from year to year. For example, when we started, a uh, majority of the victims were coming from Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, going through the Serbia and ex-Yugoslavia in the 80s uh, to the Western Europe. But uh, nowadays, uh, the trend is completely opposite. We have increased number of internal trafficking. That means uh, our nationalities as victims of trafficking within the borders of Serbia, which doesn't mean we don't have international trafficking, uh, but uh, it's less visible after the visa liberalization and it's uh, uh, harder to track these victims um, before somebody call us uh, to help them. Um, also, what have been changed is modus operandi of traffickers. So we witnessed, uh, witnessed at the beginning of the uh, uh, 21st century uh, a lot of victims uh, with bruisers, with uh, very severe uh, uh, trauma and so on. Nowadays, we see less of that. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but traffickers are using more sophisticated methods of control of victims, like with blackmailing, psychological control, blackmailing with the family, children, that they will put some photos online or send to the family and so on. So they also learn how we learn. They also um, uh, they are improving their methods. Uh, also, what is, uh, uh, I can say, new old trend, uh, already I mentioned this uh, massive labor exploitation cases. They are not anymore only individual cases, but now we are talking about um, cases of uh, labor exploitation on the construction site in the agriculture of uh, 400, 500, 900 people, which is then completely 
um, uh, have we have to think in the other way of the assistance when we are talking about these massive uh, labor exploitation cases. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we had increased number of calls for 130 percent and field actions 44, increased for 44 percent. And one of the explanation is that institutions who were supposed to provide assistance in that time actually were closed. So uh, they didn't provide assistance and victims more often um, called us for the assistance. In this moment and in the last 20 years, we are providing medical, legal, psychological assistance uh, support and also support during the integration process, like finding the job, uh, uh, schooling, uh, different courses and so on. So now uh, I have a question for the audience. Uh, what do you think is the biggest need of the victims that are calling us? Why they mostly call us? What they what they want from us? Apart from all this assistance that I mentioned, or among all this assistance that I mentioned. Is it that perhaps they need to uh, regain their documents, some sort of uh, uh, formal yes. identity? Okay, that is one of the things. And that could be actually part of the 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 first thing that will pop up on the screen why do you think they mostly call us civil society organizations yeah i think maybe it might be for financial reasons since maybe some of the reasons they are placed in this position is because of the need for economic assistance uh they also call for economic uh, support but um you wanted to say i, I see your finger <laughs> Ah, yes, bingo. In 70% of cases, it's legal representation, which doesn't mean they don't want all other things that you mentioned. But for example, in medical support in 57%, psychological support in 51%, uh, need for shelter only 13%. I'm speaking about the victims that Astra supported. Uh, and reintegration, as you mentioned, like job and economic empowerment in 71% uh, schooling and so on. So uh, these statistics show us that actually, uh, of course, some of the victims need all of this assistance, some of them need only one. But in majority of the cases, when victims call at the SOS hotline, uh, it's very rarely they call from the acute uh, situation of trafficking because of different reasons. They are under control, they don't have phone, they are locked somewhere and so on. They are afraid. Uh, mostly uh, the, uh, when victims themselves call, not, I'm not talking about calls from the families and friends, and, but directly they call, uh, we call that type of calls post festum calls after they go out of the chain and then they got invitation for the court or police to come to testify uh, that's the moment uh, that's the trigger when they call um, the SOS hotline and ask uh, primarily for the legal support but then they uh, get information that they can get all other uh, types of support uh, this is very important and uh, because um, uh, uh, it's very important that the victims has legal representation and information from the very beginning, not only representation, but information about their rights, what can uh, they do, what, what kind of procedure they could expect and so on. And last year, I remember there was a question from a student uh, asking how we choose which case we're gonna take, you know? And the answer is pretty simple, we take every case. We take every case where we identify indicators of trafficking or at least um, border case of trafficking, you know, according to the official indicators, UNODC indicators. So uh, uh, the reason is very simple. We really believe that each person should have um, uh, access to justice, you know, and the implementation of all the rights guaranteed by the primarily international documents. Um, very briefly, uh, speaking of Serbia, uh, we built uh, our national reform mechanism since 2001 until uh, today. And it started with a 
uh, article on trafficking in 2003, uh, uh, trafficking human beings, which is based in the chapter called uh, Criminal Acts Against Humanity and Other Values Protected by the International Law, together with the War Crimes and Other Serious Criminal Acts. In that moment, that was very clear political will by that government to, uh, to uh, present trafficking as a very serious criminal act that they will fight, uh, fight very seriously. Um, and uh, also in the meantime, we also have anti-trafficking national council. It's uh, on the minister level, anti-trafficking national team uh, from different institutions, NGOs and international organizations, anti-trafficking strategy, action plan, standard operating procedure uh, procedures. And last year, uh, finally, we, after years and years of advocating, we got national rapporteur. Uh, and um, this is something like now we have the closed mechanism uh, with all institutions necessary, but what we lack is implementation of everything that we have on the paper. And when I speak, uh, say implementation, I uh, mean uh, in each concrete case, but also what Astra is doing is uh, Astra is uh, collecting all the judgments on trafficking in Serbia for the last uh, now 11 years. And we analyze these judgments so we can monitor the trends, you know, uh, in the implementation of the victim's rights. So uh, what this analy uh, analysis is showing is that even uh, the minimum sentence in Serbia is three years and uh, it could be three to 12 years to the for the basic criminal act of trafficking. The average sentence, uh, sentence is three to five years of jail. So closer to the minimum. Uh, in 63% of cases, uh, public is excluded from hearings when victims are testifying. In 50% of cases, the victims are awarded a special uh, vulnerable witness status, uh, which could bring very uh, many um, uh, positive things for the victims, like testifying through the video link and so on. But in practice, that usually doesn't work because video links are not working or software is old or judge doesn't know how to use it. So uh, in 50% of cases, they are granted by this status, but uh, that doesn't mean much to them in, in practice. And uh, also, uh, what, what is very worrying, that is the compensation for victims is, is very weak. In 20 years, we had out of these 560 victims, only three victims granted compensation for what they have suffered in the civil court procedure. Even our law uh, uh, allows a criminal court judge also to decide on compensation. They don't have that practice. Also, a very long-term trend is uh, uh, every year we have a uh, fewer number of judgments. For example, in the last three years, we see double de decrease of number of judgments. Like three years ago, we had 40 judgments per year, two years ago, 20, and last year only 10. So we try to discover what's wrong, you know, where are the judgments, because we have the same number of police uh, uh, and prosecutor uh, uh, files. Uh, charges and then we discover actually that during that process somehow prosecutor decide to change the criminal act of trafficking to mediation and prostitution to do prequalification and then to do plea bargain with the trafficker which means um, for a very weak criminal act let's say minor criminal act mediation and prostitution which means that trafficker pays some um, uh, money some fine and then um, he's free and victim actually is never in informed about this and so she can not claim the compensation. Uh, so uh, even this looks very depressive. Uh, we have two, uh, last year, two very promising practices that I would like to mention. Uh, last year, we uh, got the first constitutional court decision uh, on um, a child, uh, uh, child victim uh, who was sexually exploited where constitutional court uh, recognized that uh, her rights were completely violated, not only by the trafficker, but by the system itself. And constitutional court decided to, uh, to award her with a compensation, which is for Serbian circumstances are pretty high. Um, and uh, they are, we don't have time now, but uh, uh, that, that uh, decision, constitutional court decision has some very good points referring to the international law. And uh, 
we just hope that all judge, judges will read that uh, decision. The second one is the European Court for Human Rights decision, Zoletic versus Azerbaijan. It's famous Serbos case that Astra was involved since 2009. We actually supported workers who came back from Azerbaijan who were exploited there. And we, after having no reaction from the institution, we were desperate, so we wrote the report. And that report was used later to, to have this decision. And uh, uh, we are very glad that after so many years, we have this decision. And um, later, I will read you my favorite sentence from, from, uh, this, judgment, from this judgment. Uh, so uh, just focusing now uh, only to the labor exploitation. Uh, the first case of labor exploitation uh, Astra had in 2006 it was the case of individual case of labor exploitation of a young engineer in Malta in the construction site where he was enslaved. He managed to escape uh, and came back to Serbia, but unfortunately he didn't manage to, to, uh, to, to, to gain uh, any satisfaction after, after that uh, uh, legally or through the system. All other cases of labor exploitation that we had after that case were massive cases of labor exploitation. Uh, like Serbos case already mentioned in 2009, uh, cases of exploitation of workers from China in 2019, India 19 and 20, workers from Turkey in 2020, and the latest case probably you heard about it because it was pretty much in media. Um, it was um, labor exploitation and it still is of uh, Vietnamese workers in uh, tire company Ling Long, Chinese company in Serbia. They are building the tire factory actually. Uh, and that case uh, happened in November uh, last year. Uh, so what is similar to all these cases, actually that they are state supported infrastructure cases. So they are supported from the state budget and they are involving corruption and high lucrative interest of um, individuals uh, involved in this case. What is also uh, very, um, let's say, challenge, <laughs> challenging in this case is that we are talking about male victims. Why that would be challenged? Because majority of our activities uh, and assistance were primarily designed for women and uh, victims of sexual exploitation. Uh, and now suddenly you have 400, 500 men who uh, uh, who do not recognize themselves as a victim because you are, we are not supposed to use a, a word victim with a macho Balkan man. Yeah. So uh, we start from changing our, uh, our vocabulary to uh, changing uh, the assistance we are providing. So uh, when you speak to them, they want exactly everything like other victims from other types of trafficking want. So they want justice, they want this guy in jail, they want their money, they want their salaries, compensation, they won't go to go back home, so they need some money for travel and so on. But um, it's really hard for them to explain to their families because they went somewhere there to earn some money and to feed their families that now they became suddenly victims, you know, of some crime. So uh, also what is very uh, difficult in these cases, uh, usually we have language barrier. So it's really hard to, to provide assistance, uh, for example, to wait for these workers at the airport, you know, to, to see who they are, especially if there are uh, 200 of them coming at the same time. Uh, and uh, also what is very, uh, uh, what we notice in all these cases, we have recruitment agencies in the destination and origin country in relation connected. Um, also uh, what is very worrying in all our countries, especially speaking about Balkan region, we don't have supply chain responsibility, like for example, US, UK, Netherlands, and some other countries has. So the modus operandi of these companies um, is very similar in all these cases. And that is the main uh, investor engaging a sub-investor, a uh, completely new company to engage workers. So when the case happened, they say we have nothing to do with the workers, it's the other company. So governments usually say, you see, they have nothing to do with the workers, but actually if we would have uh, uh, supply chain responsibility in our laws, for example, the situation would be different probably. Um, also, uh, what is similar to all these cases, there, in, there is no 
a reaction or at least there is no proper reaction from the institutions like labor inspection, ombudsman, prosecutor, police, and at the end judiciary because there are no cases, there is no prosecution, so there is no cases. Uh, I think last year uh, Serbia got the first judgment, unfortunately negative on labor exploitation. After so many cases we had only first judgment came last year. Uh, and, um, uh, but in, for example, uh, in this, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Ling Long case, we had a great reaction from the international community. So we had a great pressure. We got a EU parliament resolution on this case. We got uh, reactions from the UN special reporter on trafficking, on slavery and several on migrants, several others. We also got the recommendations a uh, few weeks ago from the UN uh, ECOSOC um, committee uh, regarding particularly the Linglong case. So we expect the Serbian government to do something about these recommendations in the future, in the near future. So uh, to conclude regarding the labor exploitation, mass labor exploitation cases, uh, definitely workers are uh, usually recruited from uh, far or near East countries. In Serbia's case, the, that was workers from Balkan region, Serbia, Bosnia and Macedonia went to Azerbaijan. But in all other cases that I mentioned actually were workers from India, Turkey, China and Vietnam came to Serbia working for Chinese company. Uh, also, uh, what is similar to all these cases is coercion about the job conditions. So work and living conditions uh, were not as they were presented by the agencies at the beginning, they were much worse. Also conditions uh, in the country of destination for migrant workers, at, at least according to the Serbian law, should be minimum at the same level, standard level as for the Serbian workers, which was not the case in all, in all these uh, cases that I mentioned. Uh, and this is something that uh, labor inspectors could react, for example, but they didn't. Uh, also, a limited freedom of movement. Most of these workers, they don't speak language. Their passports are taken away. Usually with the explanation, we need to provide you a residence permit or working permit or so on, but actually they didn't have it. Uh, and uh, in the Ling Long case, for example, workers were uh, surrounded, and in Serbo's case, they were surrounded by the wire, you know, like in the work camp. Uh, and they could move, but only they could go to the place where, where they were staying and uh, sleeping, which is not a five-star hotel. Uh, and uh, also what is very uh, uh, symptomatic for these cases, it's heavy exploitation, too many working hours, lack of equipment, poor accommodation. Uh, also contracts that they signed, they, were, uh, they signed the contracts on the language they don't understand. Uh, parts of that contract or full contracts were completely against the law, uh, in this case, Serbian law, for example. Um, and uh, also parts of the contracts, like some annexes, uh, were referring to the Shariat law, for example. If you go to Serbia and work and you have something with a Serbian woman, we will cut your hand. That was, for example, written in one of the uh, one of the annexes of that contract. But uh, before getting the D visa to enter the Serbia, this contract had our ambassador in Jakarta, Ministry of Interior and National Employment Agency of Serbia. Obviously nobody read the contract, you know, and they provided D visa for uh, entering uh, the Serbia for uh, working the reasons. Uh, and uh, also what is very visible in all these cases are constant threats to the workers. For example, even when the institution spoke to them, you know, they speak with a translator who is provided by the company, not independent translator. And of course they will not say anything. Of course they are afraid. Um, uh, and uh, last but not least, definitely the, the role of the government and the political element in all these cases is something that is uh, a big challenge for um, investigating and uh, going further. And um, uh, I will just now go to this and end up with this sentence, uh, bearing in mind that um, in almost 
in all of these cases, institutions said that they are not in charge or at least that um, some things didn't happen or uh, that workers didn't use all the proce procedures or all the uh, remedies they could, you know. Um, even they were in all these conditions that I explained. Uh, in Serba's case, uh, Zoletic versus uh, Azerbaijan, uh, the court in paragraph 209 concluded, having regard to the fact that uh, there has not been an effective investigation, although the matter had been sufficiently drawn to the attention of the domestic authorities, the court rejects the government objection concerning the exhaustion of domestic remedies and finds that the represented state has failed to comply with the procedural obligation um, to institute and conduct effective investigation by which Article 4 is violated. Uh, and if I would be my government, you know, I would be very worried after this sentence because it's not enough to have laws and to have institutions and to have national refer mechanism in place. It's important to implement and to use this mechanism in the right way and not to avoid the uh, obligations. I think I was 30 minutes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the, the floor to Alexandra Malangone, who is going to contribute, react to Maria's presentation, and then I'm gonna and we're gonna open the floor to, to the question and answer. I just wanted to add something about Alexandra that I missed when I introduced her. Not only she is now an adjunct fellow at, here at Johns Hopkins Science, but her experience and what really makes important this conversation is that Alexandra Malangone is former member of the, of the Greta body, which is the Council of Europe body that monitors the implementation of the Convention Against uh, Trafficking of Human Beings. And these, this conversation is, is particularly worthy for many, many reasons, but for this in particular. So I'm gonna leave uh, the floor to Alexandra now, and then we're gonna open the, the, the Q&A. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thank you, Maria, for, uh, for presenting uh, today here with us. I'm infinitely grateful for you that you made it all the way personally uh, to Bologna to share your experience. Um, uh, I know that many of you may have not heard about uh, the Zoletic versus uh, Azerbaijan uh, judgment. It is one, in my opinion, one of the key judgments from, from the last year that you should definitely look into. Um, uh, you know, even if you're not lawyers, I mean, it, it is such a multi multi layered um, importance uh, laid out uh, in there, and it's specifically because this is a, a this is a judgment or this is a case where uh, the the traffic the the trafficking was linked all the way to the highest uh, levels of the government of of the country. Um, so it was essentially. Um, those who had the financial interest in um, uh, deploying slave labor um, traffic from the Balkan region all the way to Azerbaijan to construct, um, uh, um, you know, um, uh, important state-funded infrastructure, as uh, as Maria had said, and uh, after reaching out, after reaching out um, to through a leaflet that, that the worker managed to find somewhere to a local lawyer who would then himself uh, reach out to the national coordinator of Azerbaijan, to the Ministry of Interior, et cetera, et cetera. He himself was later threatened, intimidated, and had to seek asylum in an in, in EU. So not only the, the workers who, as a reaction, were uh, deported, they were um, told that they had to sign a paper, forced a paper, forced to sign a paper where they would have to say we were not forced and we received our, our salaries. And it was only thanks to Maria's NGO that when they arrived in Belgrade airport, Maria was there through a contact through the OSCE, you were there, uh, the OSCE officer gave, the, gave you the information that they would be, they would be coming and that you managed to actually take down those testimonies. When the, the, the managers of, of, of the Serbas uh, learned that actually there was Astra on that, on that Belgrade airport, 
they started to send in the people to the other airports in the country, like Croatia and all other airports, <laughs> so that they would avoid that there is a presence, some presence um, of, a, of, a, of a human rights defenders on, on, on the, uh, at the airport, actually, so that, that those testimonies would not be taken. Maria, can you comment a little bit on this? Yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, that exactly was the situation. But uh, here we come to the importance of the networking. Actually, only by one call, we managed to uh, to contact the colleagues in Zagreb, in Sarajevo, and other uh, towns where they were sending the workers. So they immediately went there and again wait for the workers. So they, that that is actually the way how we managed to uh, to be in contact with so many workers after they came back. Uh, and that's why we should appreciate and cherish these networks, definitely. Um, thank you, Maria. Absolutely. The word that you had used when you started, you had words, uh, used the word network, I think, at least five times. Mm -hmm. And that is also something that uh, the Human Rights Trafficking Initiative here at Johns Hopkins tries to really um, uh, um, harness is the fact of quick transfer of information to those who may need it. Um, in that real real time situation, so the multi agency cooperation through the NGO sector, with the with the uh, with the police, with the the authors on the ground that may have uh, quicker reactions because that part of uh, of how frustrated uh, and desperate, as you said, you were in addressing um, to everybody um, information about what is really going on. Yeah, but the response is slow. If we want to document, if we want to, if we want to react, we need to be quick and we, we need to build those partnerships. Now, my question goes to, to in, into this direction. You mentioned that the trafficking in human beings is an issue of organized crime. Is it uh, in your way um, uh, understood by the practitioners, by law enforcement that what we are dealing with here is organized crime often linked up to the highest levels of uh, or maybe politicians polluted with businesses, et cetera, et cetera, that are earning their profits on the basis of, uh, of slave labor, or it is more, more likely to be seen uh, still through the prism of um, like individual, I would use the word pervert, um, trying to, uh, uh, you know, traffic girls into, into sex, change, chain them to a table um, and, and uh, exploit them, um, you know, in, in any, any other ways, but because the ways may be multiple, but we just to see it as, as this kind of one type of exploitation, not through the complexity of what actually dealing with organized crime uh, means. Uh, I used to believe that uh, they are seeing it in the first way that you how you explain it, but uh, unfortunately, practice is uh, saying something different. If we look, for example, in this legal analysis that I mentioned, uh, the last case uh, of trafficking before the organized crime court in Serbia happened in 2003, uh, 13, and that was a case, our case actually, of a girl who was exploited in Italy and found thanks again. Uh, to the Italian NGOs, but also Carabinieri working in uh, around that uh, city uh, in 24. She was saved in 24 hours after she uh, pressed the button. Uh, she came back, she got support, and she testified before the organized crime court. That happened in 2013. So since then, uh, we never had a case uh, in organized crime court, which uh, can tell us a lot about the political will and the way how they understand it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, of course, in each system, we have individuals who are working their job correctly and they understand it very well because the stories that we are listening and that we are hearing from the victims, they are mentioning the same names. They came from the different traffickers, but they are mentioning the same names. So obviously, if uh, someone would look for the evidence, would find it, you know. So, for example, in uh, Serbo's case, when you said it's going slowly, in Serbo's case, the uh, uh, the inspector in Serbia who took the first statement from the from the uh, worker, first worker, uh, was one of the best. We were lucky. He was one of the best uh, anti-trafficking inspectors in Serbia, having uh, more in that moment more than fifteen years of experience. But 
that statement ended up in some draw in the prosecution and stayed there, there for several years before the Bosnian prosecutor didn't start the investigation and asked for the through the international legal assistance for the documents and then start to to investigate uh, investigate case in Bosnia. Uh, so uh, at the end in 2021, uh, we got European Court uh, judgment. Uh, and the case happened in 2009. So that tells, tells us a lot about efficiency of the judiciary. <laughs> uh, Maria, this brings me directly to another question. And I, I, I put three papers here because this is how I th structured my thoughts when, while you were speaking. Um, um, and th this, this is a little bit of a, dev a devil's advocate question coming also from, <laughs> coming from a lawyer. But it is normally a lay person would ask you, why would a victim need, need a lawyer? Most of the time, we're used to having a defendant who has this lawyer. We see these defendants in courts and in the proceedings, and we, we see the way how they look at us with a lot of uh, superiority and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Why would a victim need a lawyer from your point of view? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, uh, this criminal act is a very serious criminal act, is ex officio uh, criminal act, which means that uh, pros uh, prosecutor need to press charges and go for it. Um, but uh, no matter mm, on that, uh, it's really important for each victim. Victims are not so like happy to go to the court and testify and face the trafficker. Their biggest fear actually, after everything they survive, that they will face the trafficker again in the courtroom. And this is why we need this special status of special protected victim uh, witness and uh, video link special rooms and so on. Uh, we have these video links in several uh, courts in Belgrade, but uh, still the circumstances are not so good. For example, many times when we are following victim to the courtroom together, with a lawyer uh, and with a social worker as a psychological support, we meet in the same corridor as uh, with the trafficker. In that moment, she's completely free. No matter of the um, how long she is on therapy and prepared and uh, prepared that that could happen, she's completely free. Many times it happened that she entered the room and that she says that uh, she lied everything she uh, don't remember and so on and so on. Uh, and not to say about um, you know, public in the room, which is usually on the side of the trafficker, which uh, who is yelling and uh, screaming, supporting the trafficker, and so on. Uh, so it, it would be really frustrated. We had a case of a boy I remember who was uh, uh, forced to commit uh, victim of trafficking for committing a criminal act, and uh, his recovery was going so well, you know, so well. Uh, he finished the school, he found the job, he ran the apartment, he got married, he got uh, got a baby, you know, everything. And then he got the envelope after so many years because the trafficker escaped. So they arrested him and the trial started. In that moment, his regression, according to the, our therapist, uh, I'm not professional in that sense, but according to her, his regression went five years uh, in the past, you know. So she needs to work again and again with him. So it's really important uh, um, uh, from that point of view, but also because of the legal perspective, because victims, they don't usually, they don't understand the legal terms. You know, they don't know what they, uh, when I uh, speak about legal assistance, uh, I uh, think from the first moment of providing the main information about the rights, about the procedure, what will happen, who will sit where in the courtroom and so on, until the final representation and compensation claims and so on in the civil or criminal procedure. So for us in Astra, it's really comprehensive uh, approach speaking about uh, legal professional. And it's, that is why we created the network because it's important to have several lawyers, professionals, not only in the main cities, capital city, and but all over the Serbia. So this network is covering the whole Serbia and it's important to uh, have regular meetings and to regular updates of the knowledge and uh, new trends and so on, which uh, we are trying to do every year. Um, thank you, Maria. And I would have a, a last point, and it's more um, a, a, a personal to you, uh, but also to your colleagues and your colleagues in Serbia and other countries. Uh, what does it mean for a human rights defender, human rights lawyer like you are, to operate for so many years um, in a hostile environment? 
you don't particularly operate uh, in an environment which may always be very favorable into your independent work that you are doing. What does it what does it mean for a human rights lawyer, human rights defender to work in such environment? Thank you. Yeah, it's a trick question. Uh, yeah, definitely it's uh, challenging, uh, but it's interesting. That's in short, it's really challenging. Uh, uh, we are, my colleagues, particularly colleagues who are working directly with victims, they are very often uh, um, burned out. And that is why we have obligatory supervisions and uh, meetings and uh, talking to the therapist, psychologist, and so on, not only victims, but the team itself. It is challenging, but I must say it's also so creative and gives you so much freedom because everything that you uh, see, uh, that you notice that it's not working, that you can change, you can do it, you know, at, at least you can try. Uh, while when you're working in institutions, you still have to uh, to follow some rules and to depend on someone else but here uh, it's completely different and that is why actually i like personally i like uh, this uh, civil society and your work okay thank you both um for your comments there are uh, some questions online i am going to uh, read First, one question from uh, Raji, who is listening from home, just because he typed this question very early on, and I feel he owes uh, to, to, to be heard and to have an answer, especially his first question was, is your organization able to identify those uh, who are actually reaching out to traffickers for their business? So some kind of preventive mm -hmm. action. It's an excellent question. I forgot to mention that in my presentation. Uh, SOS Hotline is not only uh, supporting victims, but also supporting uh, potential victims or people in risk, you know, by providing information such as this. So many people, and we like this, we call it a preventive type, of course. We, uh, we like them very much. And when they increase, we have de decrease of uh, the other type uh, uh, of calls from the victims themselves. Usually they call to, for example, to check the contract, to check the employer, to check the destination country, and our lawyers do that. We do not recommend agencies and employers, but we can always check whether the contract has some um, tricky parts, you know, that could uh, lead, to, to lead to slavery or something similar. Uh, so, uh, yes, we also, uh, when we uh, have information that the company, for example, or agency um, uh, didn't obey the law, let's say in a nice, polite way, uh, then immediately we inform not only police, but uh, in, uh, labor inspector and trade inspectors and everything, everyone else who are, who are in charge for that part. Uh, and in many cases like that, we manage to prevent trafficking. And um, again, you have desperate people who, even if you say we already got a call for that ag agency and we would not recommend because we saw that contract. We, we really had, some people really had bad experience. We had cases that even after that, uh, people who are desperately needs work or, you know, to, to support their families, they decide to go for it. So it's at the end, it's the decision of the person, uh, him or herself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will take a question from the floor if there's any in the room. Anyone? Here you go, Charlotte. No, please go ahead. Don't worry. Um, please I'll say your name if you may, if you want where you come from, but only if you want. Uh, <laughs> my name is Katarina. I'm from Serbia. Um, <laughs> I guess I have a very specific question. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, corruption being a very large issue and kind of like working uh, an uphill bat battle against institutions. Um, do you have any collaborative relationships with other multilateral organizations that are kind of maybe aid you? I'm thinking specifically maybe like Transparentno Serbia or even like uh, American Chamber of Commerce Serbia, uh, like in the supply chain issue that you brought up? Well, yeah, supply chain is something that we are just starting now to, um, we are assessing actually different models and what would be the best model uh, for Serbia 
and then we will go deeper and try to do more of advocating for for that but yes we cooperate with transparency uh, international in serbia and uh, with many other organizations from the security uh, issues and uh, women issues and uh, human rights in general uh, actually when serbia uh, started the process of um, uh, pre-EU process, actually, a session process to the EU, we created a network called Preugur. Uh, it's a network of uh, seven organizations from the different fields, and we are monitoring chapters 23 and 24. So we cooperate very, and transparency is one of the organizations. So we cooperate very closely. But uh, we, ha we had several attempts uh, to put these two in, in uh, connection, corruption and trafficking. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't give much result in practice, but it was a good way to uh, learn from each other, you know, because they learn about trafficking, we learn about corruption a lot. So uh, definitely this kind of networks are important. This is the sixth time I mentioned it, but also um, we learned a lot from the colleagues from other countries. I think we have a contact point in almost every country in the world. And it's really important now, especially speaking about uh, direct assistance to victims. For example, if you have a victim from Slovakia, you immediately you know who to call and uh, who can support uh, in the particular case. There's a question online from uh, a colleague, actually a fellow of the CCSTD, Marko Milenkovic. So thank you, Marko, for sending this email from Belgrade. Uh, and he's asking, Serbia is facing growing labor shortages in many sectors of the economy. How do you assess abilities of the Serbian civil society to address growing human trafficking to the country and abuse of foreign workers, especially in poorer areas of the country and outside of major cities? I may couple this question with Raji's comments. Could you please tell us from which countries migrant workers are brought in Serbia, from which countries they're brought in? Yes, we had in Serbia cases of uh, labor exploitation of workers from China, from Turkey, from India, uh, and from uh, Vietnam. Um, speaking about this, uh, usually it's construct, uh, construction site uh, exploitation on construction sites, agriculture, and uh, in Slovakia, we had a case of um, uh, in the car industry. Uh, but uh, it's a good question, you know, speaking about um, uh, speaking about capacities of NGOs, not only in Serbia, but in every country, you know, uh, in numbers, uh, only two organizations in Serbia are providing direct assistance to victims. There are several more dealing with the prevention and other things. But if you if we find victim tonight, there are only two places where you can take the victim. That's that's it. On the other side, uh, these organizations are not supported by the state at all from the state budget. For example, I can speak on behalf of Astra. Our main donor is European Commission and delegation in Serbia and Brussels and several foundations and the embassies, and that's it. So we depend completely on the project. And uh, sometimes we are frustrated, you know, like we would need uh, more capacity to do more, but then we say, okay, stop, you know, we are just an NGO, we are civil society, we are not here to heal the world, you know, we are here to do as much as we can. But uh, of course, there are some institutions who are in charge uh, and we should make these in institutions do their job. Uh, this is a, a true conclusion that uh, Serbia, uh, Serbian civil society addressed growing human trafficking uh, on one side for the purpose of labor exploitation and on the other side we have lack of workers and we have a lot of construction sites. But uh, what Serbia can do and other countries as well, but speaking uh, uh, about Serbia is for the beginning respect uh, its own laws, because our laws are pretty much good, not talking about criminal law and trafficking definition and so on, but also other laws are prescribing something. For example, our constitution is saying that migrant worker cannot have a worse, be in worse position than a domestic work. Only that, you know, nothing else. Let's start from there. Let's start for, uh, from implementing what we have and then uh, to improve. Definitely, we 
think that mm, uh, migrations are okay, but um, uh, government needs to uh, to to arrange uh, the standards of work and uh, living and working conditions in a way that they are acceptable, you know, because the premises that we found, for example, in Linglong factory, where these people were living, you know, without water, without electricity, with the sign saying dangerous material, and they are sleeping and living nearby, you know, like two meters from there, it's really, not to say frustrating, but it's really uh, worrying. So uh, definitely uh, to have migrants from other countries is okay, but uh, governments need to arrange some standards before. Thank you. Is there any question? Daniel and then Tim. Hi, uh, thank you so much. My name is Daniel. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about Astra's advocacy work and if it relates to the issue you're just saying about getting Serbi Serbian authorities to implement the laws that currently exist and what that looks like. Um, yeah, what kind of avenues to change are there in that area? Uh, uh, there was one slide about that I forgot to put. Uh, so uh, regarding the advocacy work, uh, we have advocacy plan and we have topics we want to go for. That is something that we uh, identify as the main topics, for example, for this year. But usually it's for a longer period of time because in Serbia you cannot um have a result after one year of advocating so uh i will uh give you several examples in, before 2003 we were advocating a lot we had media campaigns on uh introducing uh, criminal act of trafficking in our law because we didn't have it and we got it in 2003 it's not only because of of course uh, astra advocating but of uh, because of many other circumstances in this political moment that happened you know uh that was the year that our, when our prime minister was uh, killed. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, for example, we were advocating a lot for non-punishment, uh, implementing non-punishment closure, Article 26 of the uh, uh, Council of Europe Convention Against Trafficking, because we noticed that a lot of victims that we were supporting, several of them, not a lot of them, but several of them, were convicted, not recognized as the victims, and convicted for the criminal acts they committed uh, while they were uh, in trafficking chain. Um, and as you know, there is a Article 26 um, saying that shouldn't happen. Uh, so we uh, we do a lot of uh, advocating on that. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to have that special paragraph in the law, but we managed to have uh, recommendations. Um, we use actually recommendations from the OSCE. They were implemented in Serbia, recommendations for judges and prosecutors, what to do in such a situation, you know, because uh, when they when they have case like that, uh, the last but not least, uh, we also uh, uh, did a lot on compensation. I also mm, I'm not satisfied with the result. We wanted to see compensation fund for victims in Serbia. We didn't manage to do it. Uh, the usual reason and explanation we got from the government is how much the question is how much it would cost you know and then we did a feasibility study and we saw it would not cost much and also we gave some solutions how you can you could uh, fill in money in that fund you know from the lottery from the uh, not from the taxpayers but from other sources you know and uh, unfortunately we are now i think the one of the rare country in the region who doesn't have this fund but victims are still need to go through the civil court procedure which is very as you know long and expensive uh to be compensated and uh the final uh, and uh, successful uh, i i uh, save that for the end is definitely national rapporteur uh that is something that we were lobbying now i think for so they taught me, I shouldn't say lobbying, but advocating uh, for six years, you know, six years through the uh, EU project. And uh, I wouldn't be fair if I wouldn't say that we really had a great support from the uh, anti-trafficking coordinator in Serbia, Mr. Mitr Djurashkovic, who realized that this is the last uh, 
a last uh, dot in the chain, you know, to, to have the full system in place. So he helped us a lot. And last year, the, we couldn't have an independent institution like the Netherlands, for example, again, because of the budget, <laughs> but we managed to place it in the Ombudsman office. So Ombudsman, we have deputy for uh, anti-trafficking, actually for reporting on trafficking in Serbia and uh, monitoring. And uh, that I think that is a really huge success. Because in this advocating work and policy work, uh, somehow the results you see very slow, you know. But um, when you assist to a victims, you can see results very fast uh, in some in some parts, at least, of assistance. Yeah, so I hope I answered your question. Hi, my name is Tim. Uh, thank you for coming again. Um, over the past few years, like China has been heavily investing into the Balkans regions with like their BRI initiatives and um, a lot of heavy investment. I think I read the other day about like a railroad that's trying to be built between Belgrade and Budapest and how China is trying to invest in that. Um, how does Astra operate in an environment where a Chinese company who's hiring Vietnamese workers operating in Serbia? And how does it balance the different human rights standards that each of these countries might have? And when it comes to the BRI and the heavy investment that they're pumping in to Serbia, how does the economics work of that where the countries where Serbia might not be interested in like maybe like turning a blind eye to human rights standards in favor of the economic input that China might have into the country? The hardest <laughs> question <laughs> for the end. Um, well, um, it's definitely hard to, 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 not only for us, but probably for the, for the state institutions and the government to, you know, to, to compare these two, like human rights on the one side and economic interest and some maybe even personal and so on interest on the other side. Uh, and that's something that we learned still, you know, even we are from NGO, but we are learning every day. For example, when Vietnamese case happened, um, uh, we completely couldn't realize, you know, we know where is Vietnam, where is China, and that's it, you know. We don't know much about economies, about investments, about all these things. So we found a contact in Vietnam, again, colleagues from NGO, who supported a lot and explained, you know, and cultural differences. And, you know, uh, for example, uh, with workers from Vietnam, we were in contact, uh, direct contact, but then we stayed in contact through the messenger and other networks, you know, and that is how we were getting getting informations from inside, you know, what's going on. Uh, but it was uh, from the beginning obvious that they are very much, um, uh, even they accept our support, they are very much cautious to give us more information. Like, obviously it was fear, but it was something more, you know. And then we learned also about cultural differences and uh, that we need more time. Uh, for example, in Serba's case, if you uh, read the report, uh, you will notice that we even mentioned the, uh, the names of the family members of the traffickers because workers who, from Balkans who came, of course, there were no language barrier, but they were uh, eager to speak and to say all the names they know. Here in Linglon case, we don't have any name. We don't have, we, we don't have, names of the manager of uh, anyone even of the p uh, persons of the guard who was taking care of them you know who was um, uh, taking care of the construction work so uh, it was uh, it is pretty different and uh, uh, then we learned a lot about the belt and um, uh, and uh, one of the latest birn uh, it's an investigative network of journalists uh, in, um, researchers shows that on the, only in the Balkan regions there are 155 construction sites uh, uh, run by ch uh, Chinese companies, and half of them are in Serbia. So can you imagine the scope of uh, of the construction and sites in Serbia? And probably it's not possible to cover all that, you know, to go around Serbia and to discover new new cases. So the only way to know about the cases. If the workers uh, come to us, if they know about us, if they can speak language, the other uh, way uh, um, is uh, important. And we, this is how Ling Long case actually was 
in the public, thanks to the journalists who discovered the case and wrote about the case, especially investigator journalists who are uh, following uh, all the China investments and um, what's going on there, you know, on a much higher level than that we are doing that, like assisting the, the victims. So, um, uh, I can say uh, that uh, your question is very complex uh, and uh, we are also learning through this process. So we will see, you know, we, we shouldn't have high expectations from uh, NGOs, but um, uh, I, I think this will not be the last case, definitely. We will have more cases like this and the only way to make some regulations. I completely understand that we have different human rights standards, you know, but uh, government of Serbia should put their own standards on their territory because I really cannot imagine situation that something happened on the construction, like it happened, for example, in Bor and uh, some other cities and the prosecutor is not going inside to check what's going on. I cannot imagine that situation in Switzerland or some other country, you know. So I think it's really important to, to have regulation in all these um, segments, not only trafficking, but also labor rights and economic and social rights and so on. Um, yeah, if I may, I had, a, I had a quick comment and I see that we are on the same uh, length because I wanted to close with a question on a partnership uh, between uh, human rights defenders and uh, investigative journalists and you now have mentioned them and got to them also going back to the Serbas case um, uh, you may know that in the in the in the Balkans there is an organized crime and corruption reporting project which did a, a great uh, job from my point of view in uh, in writing about and really analyzing what was uh, Serbas about dividing it nicely into the sections the case the minister the worker I mean, you can go on their website and 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 really learn a lot. Um, uh, as you have pointed out, also uh, following, um, I think Tim's question, um, you didn't know much about uh, China investment, uh, Vietnam uh, economic interests, uh, uh, interests of Australian mining companies in Serbia, the land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there, the blend between your knowledge as an insider. Uh, having a direct access to victims, which maybe an um, investigative journalist might not have, but then the knowledge that investigative journalists, researchers, and maybe even academia may have um, into the you know phenomena, into into social economics, into geopolitics, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can feed in nicely to then even uh, assist those who are with the law enforcement, who are with the prosecution, and um, eventually are. Uh, judges who are able to understand the complexity of the phenomenon and so again we go back to this word network that you used and i finish with the network like how the work between you concretely astra and occrp was with that serbas um uh, um case uh, yes uh, just to add uh it's a good point and just to add that uh, the these three actually videos came as a result of that, that the investigative journalist who investigated the case in Azerbaijan uh, was arrested and convicted for several years of jail. So uh, her colleagues actually continued to investigate and came out with these videos, which are great. In short, they explain the whole case and what was going on, um, uh, not only on the level of assisting the workers, but also behind, you know, the scene and with the government and so on. So yes, definitely. Uh, you mentioned the word. Uh, uh, I mentioned the word network, and you mentioned the word uh, multi-sectoral cooperation. <laughs> so we can conclude with the uh, multi-sectoral network <laughs> uh, is really something that we uh, we need in all these cases because these cases. Uh, which has this network support from the beginning end up uh, in the most positive way uh, for the victims and also for for the well-being. Yeah, I totally believe that. I believe that through this work, you don't only individually um, uh, are able to assist in a better way and reach strategic litigation cases like you did with, with Serbaz, with Zoletic, but also it's also, it has to do with advocacy, but really the work to, to live in a country where we really believe in the rule of law. Because this is what's really happening, at least in, in my view. You know, you are going after the rule of law. 
This is the country we want to be living in, in a country where the law of rule of law is applied in a way that it's it's set uh, on 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 paper, you know. Um, and uh, and the link that you have uh, made to 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 for example to corruption again and to like very lucrative interests etc cetera, etc cetera, it's something that undermines that and very deeply and we see it in Europe in the past year past years also in my country uh, Slovakia um, uh, since uh, you know 2018 but even before the black years etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think this quest never need, never 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 ends but we need to join um the forces to, to to do the work in this way so again maya thank you so much for being um here with us today and with sharing all your experience and i hope you all have enjoyed it and in, in presence and also online thank you thank you thanks for So let me just thank you officially and let me thank you officially. Let me close the seminar. I, I gather the question from the floor. So I've seen that there's no, there was no other hand uh, asking for my attention. So uh, again, I think you guys are handling the online, the end of the online session. So I'm not taking care of that. Thank you again, Maria. It was such a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.